Good morning. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to present to you God's Word for our worship this morning. Um, I would like to take a, a moment just to pray as well myself. So if you guys will join me, uh, take a moment to pray once again. Father, I thank you for this time um, to gather this morning to worship you. Please bless this time in the reading and hearing of your word. May it be sweet offering to you, Lord. Guide my words that I may not speak in error and bring shame to your name. I pray for the hearers that you may impress upon their hearts as you desire according to your goodwill. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, uh, we're going to be reading in Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 24. So if you have your Bibles, paper, or digital, please turn with me or click with me to uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 24. So last week, uh, we heard from Pastor Eric, who presented us with an encouraging word um, in and keeping our hope in Jesus Christ. And it was through the illustration of uh, John the Baptist and his, his doubt he struggled with while he was imprisoned. Today, we're going to continue and we're going to see it shift to Jesus giving a warning to those who reject him. And hopefully for us to, to also as believers to garner some wisdom. Uh, before we read our text today, I, I want to tell you a, uh, the first half of a short story. Now, this story is about a man named Elias Keach. Uh, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you've not. That's okay. I'll tell you about him. So Elias Keach is the son of Benjamin Keach. Benjamin Keach was a, a famous Baptist in London um, who stood firm through imprisonment and attempts on his life in order to share the gospel and further the Baptist beliefs uh, according to his conviction. And it was during a time when Baptist beliefs, well, they got you imprisoned and <laughs> death threats. But Elias Keach, his son, he heard his father and he would witness his father as he would stand in his faith. But Elias, he was not a believer. He did not believe as his father did. He was not converted. He was not a Christian. He was not baptized. Now, Elias, as he grew um, up into being a young man, um, he, he decided to set out on his own. And he decided to travel from London to uh, little old Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And Elias, he did not have a means to earn any money upon his arrival in Philadelphia. And as it was sometimes the tendency for some, he came up with a plan to fix that. And so he donned the robes and the collar of a clergyman and passed himself off as a clergy, or as a minister. And he would entreat congregations to compensate him for him to come and preach to them. And he found a church. Um, he found a church in Pennsylvania that invited him to come and preach, and so he went to that church, and when it came time, he got up and he started preaching. Now, I want to pause it there for a second, and uh, I want to remind you, Elias, he was not an ordained minister. He was not baptized. He wasn't even a believer himself. Um, but he knew how to act like a Christian, he uh, knew how to speak like a Christian, but he wasn't a Christian. And uh, I, I think we could agree, maybe that might have been a little problematic. Let's pause there. Let's, let's look at our scripture for today then. We'll pick up that story at the end of, of the sermon. Um, but I want you to keep Elias in mind as we, as we read through this. We're reading from Matthew chapter 11, 16 to 24. But to what shall I compare this generation? Is it like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates? We played the flute for you. You did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. 
Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So the beginning of, of this part of our text, Jesus starts with a parable. And he, he sets up the setting of this parable. It's, it's in the marketplaces. Now the marketplaces was where in his time children would gather, usually as parents would come and bring goods or come to buy goods. The children would come and that's where they could meet up and socialize. And so the setting is these children in the marketplace and they're, and they're looking to play. And the idea of uh, playing a game where some will play a flute and, and others would dance as if for a celebration or maybe a wedding um, was suggested. But they said no. They, they wouldn't participate in that game. I mean, we can use our imagination probably imagine that they said, well, nah, we played that yesterday. I don't want to play that today. Um, and so another game is offered to them. One where some will play a dirge, and others would, would mourn, maybe um, as, as was tr traditional at that time when someone passed for a funeral, paid or, or unpaid mourners. But once again, the children, they said, nah, nah, we, we don't want to. And if we use our imagination a little more, we can probably just imagine them saying, nah, that one's boring, that's too somber, I don't want to do that. And so in this parable, these children are left without responding to any of these offers given to them, and even offers that were co contrast to each other and opposite of each other, and they are left in their contrariness, their just desire not to play whatever is offered to them. Now, Jesus uses these children in their contrariness and compares them to the generation of his time. The evidence of this charge lies in the general attitude the people had towards John the Baptist and Jesus himself. So John was sent to prepare the way for Jesus and his message of repentance and baptism of water. Jesus then came with the message of repentance and salvation to any who believes in him and the opportunity to be made a new creation. Both messages were correct and from the Father according to his good will. Now, if we look at the approach they each had, we can see that their approaches were like opposite of each other, right? You know, it talks about how John, he remained in the wilderness and the people had to come out to him. Where Jesus, he went to the people, to the cities. He, he, he walked with them and talked with them, engaged with them. John, he ate locusts and honey. It just says locusts and honey. Very restrictive. <laughs> but Jesus, he ate whatever everyone else ate. John's garments were, were simple, even rudimentary. It says he wore a garment of camel hair and a belt around his waist. Jesus, he wore the same design or fabric or style that everyone else wore. You see, their approach was different, but ultimately their message was the same. As we read over this part of, of Jesus and what he is saying, I think there's something uh, we, we should also um, see and, 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 and take value in. Um, I, like to, I, I love this because we see that God used different methods to present the same message. Over the breadth of Scripture, we see God use many creative ways to present the same message, a message to call his creation back to him. Why, why is that important for us to notice, though? But I think it's important for us to take note of that because we do have a tendency sometimes to um, prioritize our preferred method of message, not message, excuse me, method. Message stays the same. 
um, our preferred method of, um, of sharing the gospel over others. And, and, you know, we can sometimes fight about that, can't we? Additionally, you know, if, if I may I extend this to worship, we can uh, disagree over our preference of style of worship when, when really it's, it's the worship of God ultimately, and as long as it's that, it, it's valid. And we can, we can sometimes fight over our preference of worship. But see, what believers must remember is what the real priority is, okay? The priority is the worship of God and the proclamation of the gospel. Um, John Piper, if you read one of his, a couple of his books, he, he likes to go back to this. Um, he says that we are made to worship, but because we, there are those who do not worship God, we are to go out and share the gospel that they may come to a relationship with them so that they may also worship. And uh, it's, it's something very uh, interesting, I think, that he points out is, you know, our, our charge to share the gospel isn't for eternity. It is actually only for a set time because one day when God comes back, he restores everything back to him, we no longer have to share the gospel, but we will solely remain in just the worship of him. So let me go back um, and just highlight that. We have to be aware sometimes in our church that if the method is consistent with the two priorities, the gospel and uh, the worship of God, we should be careful not to build disunity around preference because God God doesn't. God, God uses different methods. So let's go back to our text we read that John and Jesus called the people back to God, right? And, and we know that in reading the Gospels that some did respond to their message. But what Jesus is saying that overall the people, the population, rejected them. To John, they called him a demon or a madman. To Jesus, they called a sinner. They made personal attacks on each one, though they were not even true, right? John was not a madman, but he was focused. He was disciplined. He, he had his focus primarily on Jesus, on the coming Messiah, and what God had charged him to do. Jesus, he was not a sinner, was he? He never participated in the sin of the people. These false attacks on their characters if we really look at it, what it is, is they were just excuses to justify the rejection of the message. And, and the text demonstrates this because when we look at the accusations, they're opposite of each other. And the people found fault with both. So additionally, something we can gain from this is we must be mindful of the tendency, our sinful tendency, of, of, of human beings to reject the gospel and the tendency to give excuses for the rejection of the gospel. Uh, you might have heard it said before, oh, I, I don't go to church because, you know, I had a bad experience. The people there, you know, they weren't good. Um, oh, I can't follow Jesus because Christians, I've, I've had bad experience with Christians. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that there are Christians who have demonstrated very on Christ-like behavior, and that is something that we have to be willing to address and deal with. But we also have to be discerning when people will use, um, use excuses to reject and give us a false reason really for just their unwillingness to accept the gospel. The, the truth is, people are just contrary to the gospel because they do not wish to give up the ways of the world. And John 3, 19 uh, says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And that really kind of captures just their contrariness to the gospel and to the light that we, and the life that we can find in Jesus Christ. 
Now, if people are willing to blame uh, Jesus using false, essentially, character assassination as to why to reject the message, how much easier is it to blame someone who, who isn't perfect? Now, we must learn to be discerning when individuals use such excuses that we may not let it stir resentment among us believers, because it can. Oh, so-and-so did this, and, and they're the reason why my friend won't, won't go to church or, or won't accept the gospel. We have to be careful not to allow that to build disunity. Now, at the end of verse 19 in the text, we, we see a statement, and it says, Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Though the people gave excuses for why they re- rejected Jesus, the truthfulness of their message still stands and will be self-evident, essentially what it's saying. It was self-evident at that time by the type of signs and miracles Jesus did. It continues to be self-evident today by the fruit produced in the life of someone who has repented and come to a believing faith in Jesus Christ. It will be self-evident on the day of final judgment when we are brought before God. And so the people are without excuse. And as for believers, uh, we, we got to remember another area of discernment about others and ourselves. You know, when we talk about things that are self-evident, Jesus, Jesus actually talks a lot about that. Um, as the, the righteousness in John the Baptist and the what mighty works of Jesus gave credence or made it self-evident to the truthfulness of their message, so should it for us as Christians, as believers. You see, Jesus does not hide the fact that he has no problem distinguishing between those who bear good fruit born of true faith and bad fruit as the result of a wicked heart in Matthew 12, 33. And, and this is what it says. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. We are the tree, and the byproduct of who we are will become uh, the byproduct called the fruit. It'll become self-evident in our lives. And we don't have to look too uh, far elsewhere in the Gospels or elsewhere in Scripture where it talks about and uses similar language about discerning who is truly born again by the Holy Spirit, and who is not. As believers, we must not be fooled by others if their lives show contrary to the relationship with Christ, contrary to a relationship with Christ. We must not fool ourselves into thinking we have responded to Christ if our lives demonstrate bad fruit instead of good fruit. Naturally, The rejection of John and Jesus was self-evident by the accusations the people made. Their fruit was using attacks on their persons that were false to justify not following it. That was the fruit and the self-evidence of those who rejected Jesus. This is why Jesus begins to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. They rejected John who was sent before Jesus to prepare the way for him. And then they rejected Jesus himself, even when he did great works only one sent by God could do. Jesus first names Chorazin and Bethsaida. These are two Jewish cities near the Sea of Galilee. Jesus woefully declares that they will suffer greater judgment than Tyre and Sidon. Here in Sidon, there are two Phoenician cities that are along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And these two cities are, have a history of being denounced by Old Testament prophets because of their wickedness. They were people who were wicked and prideful, money-hungry, who would sell the children of Judea and Israel into slavery. Jesus says that these two Phoenician cities would have repented of their sin and their wickedness if he had demonstrated the works to them that he did to Chorazan and Bethsaida. They would have put on the traditional sackcloth and ash 
to grieve over their sin if he did. But when we look at Kors and Bethsaida, there was no such action done within the cities. Jesus then addresses the city of Capernaum, which he currently stood in and was the base of his operations. He asks a rhetorical question, will you be exalted to heaven? And he answers the question himself with an emphatic judgment that the people of Capernaum will be brought down to Hades. In fact, he says the infamous city of Sodom, which is synonymous with sinfulness because of the great wicked deeds of the people did there, would not have been destroyed by God if Jesus had done his mighty works among them. Because of this, the day of judgment will be more tolerable for Sodom than for Capernaum. Uh, this should be a warning that we hear today as believers and, and non-believers. There is greater privilege when we hear the gospel, and that greater privilege can result in greater judgment should we choose to reject the truth of God. The people of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum had the privilege to meet Jesus, to witness his miracles, to hear him teach, to walk with him, to be in relationship with him. And yet they rejected him. They had more than was ever presented to Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, and so they will bear greater judgment. Now I want you to consider this. Today, in our country, in the United States, in the 21st century, we have greater privilege as well. We do. We have access and freedom to the Word of God, unlike many others around the world and others throughout history. We have multiple translations. We have the gospel available and even greater revelation that continues on beyond just the gospels in which is being presented to, the, and the message in the gospel that's presented to these Jewish cities. We have more revelation than that even. Yet, many can barely find the time, if at all, to read the Bible, to know what it says, to seek God in it. You know, there are even also many Christians who choose, who claim to be a Christian, who choose to live contrary to, to Scripture and are permissive to sin that Scripture speaks against. So, in my mind, if Capernaum will bear greater judgment than Sodom, so do we, unless we choose to hear and to listen what Jesus has to say to us. Let me switch back to that story about Elias Keach. Uh, we left him while he was preaching to a congregation who thought he was a clergyman. And remember, he's not a believer, he's not baptized, he's definitely not ordained. And I'm going to read actually the words uh, from Morgan Edwards, who chronicled Baptists in the early America. And this is what he said. The project succeeded to his wishes, and many people resorted to hear the young London divine. He performed well enough till he had advanced pretty far in the sermon. Then stopping short, looked like a man astonished. The audience concluded he had been seized with a sudden disorder. But on asking what the matter was, received from him a confession of the imposture with tears in his eyes and much trembling. Great was his distress though, but it ended happily. From the date of this being written, he was converted. He heard there was a Baptist minister at Cold Spring in Bucks County between Bristol and Trenton. To him did he repair to seek counsel and comfort, and by him was he baptized and ordained. The minister's name was Thomas Dungan. From Cold Springs, Mr. Keach came to Pennepec and settled a church there as before related, and thence traveled through Pennsylvania and the Jerseys, preaching the gospel in the wilderness with great success and so much that he may be considered as the chief apostle of the Baptists in these parts of America. Now, the, the church that he, he founded, um, it says Penipet, that was the body of believers that invited him originally when he pretended to be a minister. Now, why did I include this story in this? 
Well, I include it because it was an example of someone who heard the gospel and rejected it. Okay, he clearly rejected it because he would have heard it from his father. But ironically, through his own preaching, became convicted of the truth. Uh, he's, he's known as the, the, the pastor who converted himself through his own preaching. But the reality is, is it was probably more than just his preaching. Obviously, God was working in his life. God used that moment to, re- to, to, to reveal and, and soften his heart. But it was also the work of his father and others probably throughout his life of growing up that probably also had great effect and led to, to this change. You see, Keach, he, he started as one who knew the gospel but rejected it, and he pretended, literally pretended to be a Christian. But because of the gospel and the continual hearing of the gospel, he came to become a Christian. I like this story because I think it's encouraging for us to remember that people will reject the gospel. They rejected Jesus, so why would they not also reject the gospel when we try to share it with them? But I think Elias Keach is an example of we don't know when they may choose to decide to accept the gospel, when their heart may finally be turned from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And so I think we should find um, encouragement in this, that if Elias Keach, who, who went to, to fool a congregation into pretending to be a, a minister, can himself can literally become a minister later to that same body of believers later, we can see people who, who you know, who you have witnessed to, who have rejected the gospel, who may one day accept that gospel. And it's an encouragement that we remain faithful and to strive to continue to share that gospel and to witness to those. Just because they reject the gospel doesn't mean that we're done with them. I feel really confident in saying this. If this helps you, we're using this perspective. There are people in our community who are waiting for you to share the gospel with them so that they can say yes to Jesus. Think about that. There are people who are in our community waiting to hear the gospel so that they can say yes to Jesus. And the question is, are are we going to be faithful to what God wants us to do? And it is a work with God. It's not something we do in our own strength. It is God who, who works through situations and guides the situations. But he calls us to go and make disciples. He calls us to go and share the gospel. Will we be faithful to that call? Will we be faithful and undiscriminate in where we share the gospel? So with that thought, uh, allow me this opportunity to, to take to clearly present a gospel message to you today. Um... And, and if you haven't heard the gospel, here's an opportunity for you to hear it. And maybe there are those who just need to be reminded of the gospel, because sometimes we do. We as believers need to be reminded of the gospel. So here it is. We are created beings made in God's image. God made us to be in perfect relationship with him because of our rebellion and disobedience to him. We now are not in perfect relationship with him. We are now born separated from him by sin. We are born sinful and spiritually dead. But God did not want to give up on his creation, his image bearers. So he provided a way to justly deal with the sin that we have committed and restore us back to our relationship with him. He sent Jesus who was part of the triune God to take on the form and life of a human who was fully divine but fully human, who has never sinned. Jesus lived a perfect life and in obedience to the Father laid down his life to take on the punishment for our sins because the punishment for our sins is death. 
This was done that whosoever believes and chooses to repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ may be given the free gift of salvation. God the Father validated Jesus' perfect sacrifice by raising him back to life on the third day after his death. Any who choose to believe and follow Jesus are given the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide them and make them into new creations. No longer the old sinful self, but new and free from the bondage of sin that we may begin to be made perfect. Jesus gives all who have chosen to follow him a responsibility, however. They are to go and tell others about this free gift and freedom in Christ, and invite them to become a follower of Christ. They're also called to train up new young believers in everything Jesus taught and commanded. And one day, Jesus will come back. And when he comes back, he is going to separate those who have chosen to follow him and those who have chosen not to follow him. Now, the ones who have chosen to follow Jesus... Uh, they'll be with him on a new earth. God will reside in a new Jerusalem among us. We will be able to be in the full presence of God. There will be no death. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. But those who do not follow Jesus, those who reject his message, they will be cast into an eternal lake of fire with Satan and his fallen angels, along with sin and death. This is the message and the revelation God has given us today. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a moment to pray here in a few seconds, but I, I want to wish, I, I want to offer this to you. If you have not yet made a decision to believe in who Jesus says he is, I invite you today to come forward and to make a commitment and surrender your life to him today. And if you have made a commitment to Jesus, but maybe you've become spiritually stagnant, maybe you've fallen away from your faith and and have not been living out of love for God the way you know you should be, take this moment to come forward. Recommit yourself to following Jesus and to living as he has called us it really is just a matter of asking God to help us. God is a good father who gives good gifts. If we ask him to to renew us, to make us new, to save us, he will do so. I offer the, the front of the stage here as a place to come forward as a means to present yourself to God today. If you desire someone to pray with you, I'll be sitting up at the front here, and I will, I'll be happy to pray with you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this morning and for this opportunity to share your word. I pray for those who, who are present and afar, who hear it. I pray for your words to speak to their hearts and reveal any hidden transgression against you. I pray for the ones who will hear it that do not have a saving relationship with you. I pray that they may understand what it is you have done for us and seek you because you are God and because you have chosen to love us enough to offer a means to be restored to you. Draw us closer to you, God, and put in us a yearning for what is right and holy. Bind and remove any evil that ensnares us. Bless the rest of this time as we just continue to worship you. I pray this in your son's name. Jesus, amen.